YouTube, I'm back. Apparently I have a lot to say lately. Lucky you. Anyways, back to my regular scheduled, but not scheduled uh, series of what I've been up to. And what I've been up to this uh, time around, it's kind of symmetrical. I've got three books and three games, and all three books happen to be actually hockey related. So we'll get into those first. First up, Quinn. This is a kind of a biography of uh, a NHL, uh, greatly respected NHL individual named Pat Quinn. He was uh, first a player and eventually a coach, uh, as well as many, many other hats that he wore uh, along the way. So he was born in the late or early 40s, I don't remember, in Hamilton, Ontario. Um, so my wife being from Hamilton um, and them talking about him growing up there and in the city and the streets and stuff like that, it's, it's kind of funny to hear that stuff because I've become somewhat familiar with the city. Um, uh, so Pat Quinn was a, his dad always taught him to work hard, uh, study, 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 and, and get an education, and also not take any shit from people. So, and Pat Quinn was a big boy, so people who came at him quickly learned they shouldn't have. <laughs> Um, so he was always a really good hockey player as a youngster and uh, his, his path eventually led him to uh, winning a Memorial Cup out west with the Oil Kings which eventually springboarded him to an NHL career but he was he was one of those guys who was a fringe guy uh, he didn't have a great skill set um, his his bread and butter was that he was a hard worker he was a big body and he was nasty he brought a physical element of protection and uh, and that sort of thing so that's what kept him in the league and uh, it's interesting to hear his story about how uh, when he took a tryout with somebody or whatever which back in the day when you signed a contract he but for playing with this team he was actually who fell under the Red Wings banner so he was actually Red Wings property and he didn't know that and uh, and so they kind of dicked him around when he tried to play college and get an education they're like nope he can't play there uh, so the Red Wings organization dicked him around uh, as he tried to find his way into the NHL while also getting an education so uh, very interesting uh, his his journey to the NHL and, and finally when that all sorted itself out uh, the first team he actually played for the NHL was the Toronto Maple Leafs of course the best team ever um, and, and the most famous thing I remember him for as a Maple Leaf, which I mean, he was playing long before I was born. But on Don Cherry's Rock'em Sock'em Hockey, um, he's the only guy to really have really laid out Bobby Orr. And the hit is on one of Don, Don Cherry's compilations, and he just he just comes flying down the left wing as Bobby's coming up the right side out of his own end, and uh, he looks down for a sec because he bobbles the puck a bit, and Quinn just fucking levels him like I'm talking like car crash. Bobby's down, and the place just goes crazy right and back in the 70s and stuff or 60s or whatever it was like it was fierce like line brawls bench clearing brawls fans throwing stuff fans hanging over the glass and raining down punches on people right like it was awesome i wish it was still like that um and uh it, it set off a big pandemonium in boston it was during the playoffs and, and the crowd the whole building was yelling we want quinn and all this stuff right like it, it just set off this big uh awesome uh, series of events so um and then he would go on to play for also uh, uh los An or, sorry not los angeles the atlanta flames vancouver canucks and uh, he only played about nine years in the league after that he uh he then turned it into a coaching gig with the philadelphia flyers where he uh apprenticed under ray shiro who was a very um groundbreaking coach for his time and Pat took those lessons eventually um, out on his own. He first coached the Los Angeles Kings before joining the Canucks organization. And when he joined the Vancouver Canucks, that is when he kind of put all of his skills to full use. He not only became their coach, but their GM and their president. He was the man in Vancouver. And he, uh, he turned that franchise into a contender. Um, and... Uh, was the first guy to like hire a, a sports psychologist to talk to the guys uh, a nutritionist uh, and to put them on training programs like he was really a, a groundbreaking individual in that regard and uh, and uh, I remember his team very well from the 
the 94 playoffs because that's when his team, the Canucks, beat the Leafs in the semi or in the conference finals and prevented them from going to the Cup. So, um, and unfortunately, Vancouver would lose against the Rangers in, in that Stanley Cup playoffs. So he never got a cup, but uh, he, uh, he he definitely made his mark in coaching and as a player. And eventually, he would become the Leafs coach and uh, one of my favorite coaches of all time. Him and Pat Burns, who coached the the ninety three ninety four Leafs that played against Quinn's. Uh, uh, Vancouver Canucks um, and then Pat Quinn those are my two favorite Leafs coaches by far and uh, yeah so he, he he had a lot of good years as a Leafs coach uh, I, I loved I love those teams I loved watching him coach him and Bernsey were like guys that wanted to be out there with the guys and, and you know they'd get pissed off and they'd get upset and they're basically like another player behind the bench right and uh, yeah eventually after his uh, you know as his career was winding down as a coach he was he, he added more to the resume. He coached uh, the Olympic team that reclaimed gold for Canada, um, as well as a World Junior Championship, as well as a World Cup Championship. So um, he was one hell of uh, just an NHL individual. Um, he, he didn't necessarily make it big, big as a player, but definitely as a coach and, and an executive general manager. Um, he's probably one of the best to, to ever uh, be in the league. So great book great guy unfortunately he passed away in 2014 was it yeah so that was too bad but just so you know <laughs> um, next up beauties got this one for Christmas it's written by James Duffy who is a um, um, one of the hosts uh, on, on uh, TSN uh, the sports network um, he covers mostly hockey but he does some other events as well excuse me um and uh he's a really fun guy to listen to he seems like a really good guy and a funny guy and beauties is a collection of stories that he's been told by uh not only nhl players but uh, just lots of different people in hockey um as he's talking to them behind the scenes uh you know on set or whatever when he's out on uh um covering something whatever the case may be and he's put all these little stories into this book um you know it's anything from darcy tucker of the leafs having a run-in with pat quinn when he was coach coaching the leafs which is is one of my favorite stories in the book because i love tucker and i love quinn and, and uh that was an, a leafs era thing um Sidney crosby getting a roommate that turned out all kind of weird steve Stamkos's dad stealing steve eisenman's car by accident um, all sorts of stuff and it's not only NHL players it's um, it's some AHL players it's some women's players it's uh, referees it's player agents uh, it, uh, it's announcers Chris Cuthbert we learned how he first got his big break um, yeah so it's all these little stories and the foreword of, of the book is actually from Roberto Luongo and it's one of my favorite stories is, is when he basically got the shits during a playoff game against Anaheim and uh in between periods he was he was late getting out onto the ice so their backup had to go start the period because he couldn't stop shitting himself <laughs> and uh and uh yeah so pretty funny stuff pretty interesting stuff um and a quick read too I just flew through it last up for books us against you this is a sequel to a book called Bear Town, which uh, you may remember, you may not. Uh, I reviewed back more in the summertime, I think it was. <sighs> was that this year or last year? I think it was this past summer, yeah. Um, this book takes place pretty soon after the events of Bear Town. It's, it's the story where it's uh, this little town in Sweden out in the forest called Bear Town, and uh, where hockey is the ultimate importance and uh, one of the players for the star uh, junior Barrytown team rapes the general manager's daughter. He pulls him off, gets the cops to pull him off the bus just before the championship game. And uh, people react in, in all sorts of different ways, mostly in favor of the hockey player that, that raped her because, oh, we don't know for sure and whatever. And then she just ruined our chance at a championship, whatever sort of thing. So this is picks up in the aftermath of that. And uh, the town's trying to put the pieces back together. Uh, Maya, the girl who was raped, is you know is still having nightmares and stuff about everything. 
um, and her, her relationship with her best friend Anna has become a bit strained because they're both keeping secrets because Anna's dad's an alcoholic and she's constantly having to take care of him. Benji, um, the player on the Beartown team who, who is the really tough guy um, and is also gay but nobody knows it. Um, he's finally outed by Anna when she sees him taking pictures or she sees him kissing a guy and she takes pictures posts them on the internet so everything blows up with him being a queer in a little town like that right we all know how that goes um, and uh, and then the the competition from a town called head uh, who, who is the biggest rivals of Barrytown get wind of all this stuff and uh, so they're just pushing the bear town uh, population um, kind of to the brink with their um, accusations of them being sluts and queers and rapists and all that sort of thing and, uh, and and everything else is turmoil around the Bear Club hockey team because it's after everything that's happened they're going bankrupt and they're going to disband the team but a politician in Bear Town comes up with a really big scheme to get some foreign investors from London England to build a factory in the area who will also then sponsor the Bear Town hockey team and keep them uh, from going bankrupt. Uh, but this guy's got all sorts of hidden agendas behind every move he makes and every person he manipulates. And in the end, Bear Town gets their hockey team back, but this politician plays the Bear Town inhabitants against the head inhabitants and makes their rivalry, which is normally fierce even more fierce and also deadly so the book ends kind of in this sequence of events where uh in the end somebody ends up dead and uh all sorts of other stuff happens and uh and it just ends in some craziness and what i really like about this author and and and, and the story as it goes along is he's really good at like he'll he'll write a chapter and at the end of it and he'll like lay a little thing down like but that was the wrong decision for this person to make because it made it end badly or whatever. You know, like he foreshadowed like, okay, so this person's going to have something bad happen to them in the end, but we don't know what, we don't know how, we don't know who it's related to. Like he dropped all these little foreshadowing things along the way without really giving you too much detail. So it, it kind of got you excited for the end of the book and, and kind of just, you couldn't wait to see exactly how it ended, how everybody's story is intersected and stuff like that. So really interesting story the two books together uh weave this really neat depressing but also in in times uplifting kind of tale so uh, cool books I, I definitely recommend now the first video game up is for the nintendo switch super bomberman r i've actually never played a bomberman game before in my life i always wanted to but there's just so many other games i wanted to play first and uh never got around to it so the story of this one is that uh, emperor bugler um arch nemesis of bomberman has uh resurrected or um i don't know if they're, he resurrected them or he just created them or whatever but these five dastardly bombers to help him uh lead his army and, and march them towards world domination and uh in the meantime bomberman is in his eight or nine siblings whatever he's got he's pissed off at them because they don't take their training seriously and he's busting their balls and stuff and soon enough bugler lays down his plan and bomberman's like see guys we should have been training now this asshole is trying to take off the over the world and now you guys aren't ready so there you go into the game you got to take bomberman and his siblings out and stop emperor bugler and the way bomberman works is that it's kind of like a puzzle uh it's a maze and you basically have to get to the exit of the maze but before you can reach the exit you need to satisfy some sort of a condition like you have to destroy all enemies on the board or you have to hit all the switches on the board something something like that and uh and to do that you you have bombs that's how you blow up um destructible pieces of wall that will help you clear the way and you also use the bombs to blow up your enemies and along the way power-ups will will be uncovered as you destroy stuff that uh you know um strengthen your bomb blast or or um increase your foot speed and stuff like that there's all sorts of stuff and uh and you march through the game he's taken over basically each dastardly bomber has taken over a planet in the starry sky system so you move from planet to planet 
and uh, once you make it through all five planets, uh, you fight Emperor Bugler in the end and uh, and beat the game for good. So um, it's a good game. It's it's not anything fantastic, but we had a lot of fun playing, and it's relatively short, uh, relatively easy to play. It's two player, and uh, and it just has a pretty good fun factor. So it's a pretty solid game. Next up, my cousin. Uh, that gave me loaned me all the like the Telltale games uh, where you kind of it's a story and you kind of make the decisions for the characters. He also gave me this Tekken Seven. Um, this was actually a double, so I get to keep this one, I think. Um, but Tekken, I've always been aware of Tekken, but I've never played any of the games. Um, it's a street fighting game, and in this volume of the game, there's been a war that's been raging between the um, Mishima uh, Zaibatsu organization and G Corporation who are these rival companies and the the people at the forefront of each organization um, they're kind of um, f the leadership changes but it's basically a family feud um, Heihachi Mishima and his son who has actually a devil in disguise um, and the father tried to destroy the son years ago because he knew he was the devil um, they're at odds against each other in, in, in ruling these corporations and the war that rages between them basically levels all the cities and stuff around them and the story of the game is told by a reporter whose uh, wife and daughter were destroyed or killed during uh, the war between these two corporations and so he's looking to dig in and expose Heihachi and all of his wrongs and, uh, and and get to the bottom of just what's going on between these two corporations and hopefully end this war and get some a bit of vengeance on these people so um, so as he goes through his investigation you learn the true story of what's going on between uh, behind the scenes of these two organizations and, and exactly what the truth is in the end and and as the story unfolds there's lots of cutscenes with English subtitles in Japanese language and uh, in between the cutscenes you then uh, engage in a fight a street fight against uh between whatever two characters are involved in the storyline at that time so um pretty short game as i find most street fighting games are they, they they don't take that long to play through um but i found this game actually pretty interesting because um i've never played a tekken game before so i was kind of new to it so it was it was interesting and new um and i just found <sighs> the graphics really good the characters really interesting um, and just the uh, the Japanese language with the English subtitles, I just found it really, really fun. Like it was a really neat game to just watch unfold sort of thing. So um, again, Street Fighting games I find pretty one dimensional and not really have that much of a replayability factor. So I wouldn't go out and buy that game for $80 like most PS new PS4 games are at the beginning, but um, I would definitely wait till it's more of a bargain bin purchase. But uh, but uh, definitely worth a play if you can find it, you know, for the right price sort of thing. So now last up is a PS3 game called Need for Speed Undercover. This was released in 2008 by Electronic Arts, of course. And in it, you, uh, you are a police officer, officer in the fictional city of uh, Tri-City. Um, and you are going undercover to try and infiltrate a street racing gang and, and try and bust them. Um, soon enough though, a an officer, a detective or something like that uh, named Chase Lynn, she joins your investigation as she believes there is even more link to this uh, street, street racing outfit um, in terms of uh, international uh, uh, car smuggling organizations and stuff like that. So she takes you under her wing and, and, and you get even more involved in this investigation you get in with the street racing gangs, uh, try and gain their trust, and then eventually bust them as you go along, sort of thing. So, and uh, and it all unfolds um, in cutscenes between each of the races or events that you do, and uh, eventually you just play through the story, win all the events, and of course it's the same thing. You upgrade your vehicle, 
Um, then once new cars become available, you upgrade your class of vehicle and get a new ride that's even faster, upgrade it, and, and so on and so forth until you get to the top of the heap, which is when the game kind of reaches its epic conclusion, right? So uh, pre pretty standard format for a, a lot of these racing games now. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of fun. At first I didn't like it as much as a lot of the Need for Speed games that I play. I found the backgrounds kind of a little not interactive, a little one-dimensional, especially after playing Need for Speed Payback on the PS4 not that long ago, because that game is so good. But uh, the more I played this one, the more I, I realized, okay, no, this game really is pretty good. So I did highly enjoy it in the end. So um, definitely give that one a whirl if you can find it. Um, um, for, well, PS3 games, I'm sure you can find most of them for pretty cheap. But uh, yeah, it's definitely worth a, a go if you can find it. So um, that is all for now. But uh, as you can see, I am tearing through stuff uh, at a record-setting pace, so I will be back.